Hello, and thank you for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, Lauren had technical difficulties with her uh, internet, so I, I, I will start. Um, as you know, this is the webinar on coronavirus and dysautonomia. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for inviting me to discuss this obviously very urgent topic and answer questions and concerns on coronavirus from dysautonomia community. I hope my presentation helps clarify some of the concerns that patients with autonomic disorders may have at this time. I hope to provide some scientific information on the topic to the best of our knowledge. Much of what we know about coronavirus comes from the data collected in China since the virus originated from there. And it was the first country that had had some time together and analyze data from a large patient population while fighting to contain coronavirus outbreak in their country. We are glad that Chinese researchers and the Chinese Center for Disease Control shared their data with the world so that we could learn critical information, not only about the virus and how it spreads, but also how it affects various subsets of population, including patients with various medical conditions. I will present several slides prepared by the CDC, which will provide pertinent information based on scientific facts. This presentation will be briefed so that we can devote most of the time to answering your questions on coronavirus and dysautonomia, specifically those that you guys submitted to Lauren. Of course, she's not with us, uh, but we hope she can listen in as well. Um, we will start with discussing signs and symptoms of uh, coronavirus. Uh, this is the slide uh, that I think is very informative. What are the typical symptoms? Uh, and the number one most common symptom is fever. As you see, almost um, more than 80% of patients had fever. Cough is the second most common symptom occurring in about at least 60% of patients, followed by myalgia, arthralgia, headache, and diarrhea. These are the common symptoms that Chinese researcher reported to us in Wuhan city, Hubei province, and China um, as, a country, um, as, a, as a country as a whole. We're gonna move on to the next slide. And um, this slide talks about illness severity of uh, coronavirus. I hope the slide is visible to you. Uh, I'm not sure because Lauren was supposed to um, uh, do this, uh, but like I said, she had technical difficulties so she couldn't join us. Uh, everyone worries what kind of course of illness will they have if they happen to catch coronavirus. Uh, we have this very nice sample size from China. More than 44,000 patients uh, were uh, analyzed in their uh, database. And as you see, fortunately, 80.9% had mild course. 13.8% had severe course. And 4.7% had critical course of illness Require, requiring uh, assistive um, uh, measures, whether oxygen or ventilation. As you see, those who had critical illness type of course, mortality was quite high, 49% in China. Um, this mortality is high, but it's not surprising because ICU mortality in general from whatever problem uh, can be as high as 49%. Of course, you have to remember they had uh, their medical system. It was not equipped. This was the first country to get hit by coronavirus. Um, so um, we hope that United States can do a much better job with our resources. Again, the reassuring part, as you see, is that 80.9% had a mild course. And, and, and that's reassuring. 
In the next slide, um, hopefully you can see the entire slide. Again, a very important slide from the same Chinese cohort of more than 44,000 patients of confirmed coronavirus. Um, and follow this gold line for me for a second. As you see, uh, this gold line represents case fatality rate by age group. And if we start with children zero to nine years of age, and we follow by about 30 to 39, 40 to 49, as you see, the, the line is very low, close to zero, but it's not zero. I think when you look at the slide, one can interpret that, that these patients were um, um, completely fine, uh, but the mortality was um, also um, present. Um, I, I'm not sure I, you can see again my slides, but let me try and see. Okay, I think now my slides are visible. Um, again, you have to excuse me as I wasn't prepared to use this webinar, <laughs> but you know I have to learn on a, on a sh very short notice. Um, you know, because I don't believe my first two slides were visible, let me go back there really quickly. Okay, this was my first slide. Quickly, I wanna um, um, uh, uh, I wanna sh discuss that once again. Symptoms and signs of coronavirus. The most common one was fever. Almost more than 80%, close to 100, had high fever, followed by a cough. More than 60% had cough, followed by myalgia and arthralgia, muscle and joint pain followed by headache and diarrhea. There were other symptoms as well. Uh, you can have some sore throat, you can have um, uh, um, aches and pains, uh, you can have GI symptoms aside from diarrhea, but these were less common. In my next slide that I don't think you saw, but there you go, hopefully you're seeing this now. This was illness severity from a large Chinese cohort of more than 44,000 patients. And the reassuring part is the mild course here was present in 80.9% of patients. So that's very reassuring. Severe, 13.8%. Critical, 4.7%. Out of that critical 4.7%, the death rate in the ICU was high at 49%. And as I already mentioned, you know, the country may not have been prepared. So this is quite high uh, ICU death. Reassuring parts is that mild course is present in almost 81% of patients and this cohort is very large. Now we get to this age distribution and the yellow line of case fatality rate. And as you can see, um, what I already mentioned, when we get to about 40 to 49 years of age, you see how close to zero this line is. Uh, that means mortality is very low. Now you see it starts to take off in the mid 50s and definitely after 60 years of age. This is why the recommendations from CDC is that those over age of 60 should have special precautions. Um, um, regarding the coronavirus. Uh, as you see, the higher age you get, 70 to 79, it gets about 8%, over 80 years old, quite high, almost 16%. This is the gold line. And as you see, age factor is quite a prominent um, um, aspect in determining mortality rates. The good thing about this graph and the reassuring part, if we can't find anything reassuring in that whole pandemic situation, is that most of our patients are, as you know, in the autonomia world between ages 15 and about 50. Of course, different types of the autonomia will have different distribution ranges. And those with orthostatic hypotension tend to be in the older age. Uh, a lot of them are, are after 50 years of age. Uh, we also have other types of um, 
um, dysautonomia that are present in kids, like familial dysautonomia, which is a very severe um, uh, form, uh, rare, severe form that may include breathing compromise. So those are different kinds. Majority of POTS patients fall between ages 15 and 50 years of age. They're quite young. So prognosis is good. That's reassuring. Moving right along, we have data from China on the underlying medical conditions. And this is what everyone wants to know, rightfully so, because dysautonomia is a chronic illness. Is this a factor? Should I be concerned more than the average person, than the healthy person my age? As you see from the slide right away, the gray bar over here is the critical form that we talked about in previous slides. As you see, if you have hypertension, there is a high risk of critical form, hypertension. Next, we have diabetes. You see, in diabetes, we also have a critical uh, bar that's quite high, more than 20%. Cardiovascular disease, which includes your congestive heart failure, coronary arterial disease, and, and other heart diseases. Uh, also, you know, the critical form is quite prevalent. Interestingly, lung disease, by proportion of people, um, um, occupies um, also a, a significant percentage, but interestingly, much less than hypertension. There, that's why you hear from CDC website and other specialists from the government is that if you have hypertension, you are at a significant risk. This is worth mentioning. Now you get to this to these uh, small bars. This is your immunodeficiency diseases. Um, and they represent a small portion of the cohort. So as you see, it's hard to draw any conclusions because there were much less patients in this general cohort uh, than there were hypertension patients. So we don't know, except to say that there was some severity there, mild course. We don't know how many had critical um, illness. My last slide um, before we get to the questions is the general general recommendation from CDC that you hear everywhere on TV and social media. What can you do to help prevent the spread of respiratory illnesses? Uh, well, first, avoid close contact with people who are sick. And this is done now by social distancing. Um, lots of schools are closed. Lots of states are asking people to stay home. Whether you're um, older, whether you have medical conditions, or if you're healthy. Because by staying home, you help prevent spread of the infection and you help the medical system handle difficult cases. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. This has been said many times. You should do that, it's very important. Wash hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. If you don't have soap and water available, use a lot of hand sanitizer. Of course, it's a, it's a, hard, it's a hard commodity this, these days. Uh, but be sure to clean surfaces, especially plastic and metal. Um, virus can stay on surface for days. Uh, but the good thing about this virus, again, if we can find anything good, is the fact that it's an RNA virus that has a very um, susceptible envelope. Every virus has a covering, and this envelope, which is the covering of the virus, is quite susceptible to cleaning agents uh, and alcohol-based solutions and heat. Um, so disinfect surfaces and don't assume that because nobody touched it for a day or two, it must be clean. Like I said, the virus can stay on these surfaces for at least three days, if not longer. Uh, your hands carry germs. Um, you can't see, so wash your hands. That, that's a little picture. 
Um, please note that I am not able to uh, respond. I don't see your questions live. I have no idea how to do this. I'll try as <laughs> as we go along. I'll try. Um, hey, so Dr. Bush, it's Lauren. I finally logged on and I okay. can see the questions everyone's sending. Okay, thank God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because Sorry, guys. We, I had some technical difficulties I've never had before doing a webinar. My it just okay. wasn't working, and I, I actually tried logging in as a regular guest, and I, I it looks like the webinar is full, and so uh, I want to apologize to anyone who registered and can't get in. I, I think we've maybe overloaded the webinar system with our interest in coronavirus and dysautonomia. Um, so, Dr. B, are you ready for, for Q&A, or do you want to um, do um, some more slides? Uh, no, I am done with slides and I am ready for questions that you sent me at the beginning, you know, starting with what people are at high risk of serious complications. Um, so that's uh, those you have those questions. So if you want to uh, sort of state the question that people had sent in yes. and then go yeah. through the answers, maybe that's the best way to do it. Yes, yes. OK, so this is the first question Lauren sent me what people are at higher risk of serious complications we'll go to the slide with the um, yellow line I, I i'm gonna stay with that graph because i'll refer to that often okay so currently two factors appear to increase the risk of severe coronavirus age as you see follow the gold line and comorbid condition as conditions as we discussed from the previous slide um more the risk increases at and above age 60 and is especially high in 70 and 80 year olds in terms of comorbid conditions as i just said hypertension cardiovascular disease diabetes and chronic lung disease are risk factors for severe coronavirus scores uh, also if you have an immunocompromised state which we will discuss what that means what that term means you also have a risk uh, for severe form we do not have data on how this virus impacts those with specific autoimmune disorders and we also don't have data on on those with autonomic disorders so we hypothesize we assume we extrapolate and we but we don't have a, um, a solid data to back up our opinions the second question is what medications count as immune suppressive so on that note i want to reassure patients with spots and many others for many other forms of dysautonomia that all of the medications that we use for POTS specifically do not suppress the immune system including fluorinef at the doses that we use if you do have a comorbid autoimmune disorder like sjogren's lupus rheumatoid arthritis psoriasis multiple sclerosis and myasthenia gravis, and by, by any means, this list is not exhaustive. Ask your doctor whether the medications that you take are considered immunosuppressive. Specifically, again, I repeat, medications such as Florinef and also Plaquenil are not considered to be immuno immunosuppressive. Steroids, IVIG, and various biologics are immunosuppressive therapies. Moving right along to the next question, and that's that's coming, the million dollar question, okay? Does spots increase the risk of serious complications? Is it the kind of questions that everyone asks, and that's very important to discuss. So let's deconstruct this question a bit. First, what constitutes serious complications? If we're talking about supplemental oxygen, the use of ventilator and death from coronavirus because of POTS, then no, we don't have any reason to suspect that that's the case based on the data from China and other countries. As you recall from slides, data from more than 44,000 coronavirus patients in China tell us that age and comorbid conditions explicitly hypertension cardiovascular disease lung disease and diabetes are the main risk factors for complications 
I want to stress that we do not know because as you can imagine, nobody went to study specific subset of populations while there was a crisis going on and they were trying to save patients. So we don't have data on patients with specific autoimmune disorders or specific autonomic disorders like POTS. Uh, POTS specifically has not been studied and we also don't have any data on um, the course of coronavirus in patients with other neurologic disorders. We don't know how it impacts multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, and Parkinson's disease, common neurologic disorders. If you do have high blood pressure, diabetes, and asthma, then this may raise your risk. If we're talking about exacerbation of POTS following an infection, then I think it's safe to assume that coronavirus can potentially worsen POTS symptoms, similar to how influenza can worsen POTS symptoms. I also would like to mention that normally fever and infection cause an increase in heart rate for anyone. This is the body's natural response to fighting an infection, since fever is an important component of the body's natural defenses against an infection, like a virus, like a bacteria. In patients with spots, fever may, may cause even greater resting and postural tachycardia than in healthy people, which can lead to worsening of palpitations and orthostatic intolerance. If this happens, I often rec recommend to, to my patients to increase their daily dose of their POTS medications. So for example, if you're taking a beta blocker, you may need an extra dose of your beta blocker while you're having a fever, while you're fighting an infection. If it's fluorinef, midodrin, or evabridin, you may need to take a higher dose while you're fighting an infection. As always, we recommend aggressive hydration above your daily intake and the use of over-the-counter medications to reduce fever, like Tylenol. You should ask your doctor, of course, which of the over-the-counter medications are best for you, given your specific allergies, symptoms, diagnosis, and daily medications that you take. Some patients have an allergy to ibuprofen. Others cannot take Tylenol, either due to a liver problem or a mitochondrial disorder. So your doctor should help you choose with which over-the-counter medication to take. I do want to mention one more thing, is that there has been some talk about whether ibuprofen um, is um, indicated or even good to take during this uh, um, coronavirus um, a course of illness. Um, the honest answer, we're not sure. There is some speculation because it may raise uh, ACE um, angiotensin converting enzyme level. So the jury is still out. I don't have anything official. Um, I, I think some people want to be, you know, proactive and maybe use Tylenol for fever and aches and pains if you happen to have um, coronavirus. The next question uh, we have is, what do we know about the immune system in POTS? Very good question. So we don't yet know whether POTS is associated with any abnormalities in the immune system. And hopefully we will find out soon from some, some of the studies that are currently being done. We do know that there is a relationship between the autonomic nervous system and the immune system. And we can suspect that some, some POTS patients do indeed have some type of immune dysfunction, especially if they have comorbid autoimmune and immunologic disorders. For example, in my study from um, a few years ago, we showed that the, there was a higher prevalence of comorbid autoimmune conditions in patients with spots compared to the general population. In that sample, we also had an unexpectedly high number of common variable immune deficiency patients in our patient cohort of 100 patients, which could have been a coincidence. There was another study from Vanderbilt also a few years ago, which demonstrated that sympathetic activation in POTS is associated with increased IL-6. IL-6 is one of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
If we look at the literature on immunologic abnormalities in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, for example, some of whom have POTS and other autonomic disorders, we will find numerous studies pointing to the immune dysfunction in that patient population. Chronic fatigue syndrome patients do display alteration in natural killer cells, in natural killer receptors, adhesion markers, and receptors on T cells, CD4 plus and CD8 plus. CSF patients um, also um, can have various elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines compared to healthy controls. So my opinion, based on clinical experience with patients and certain findings from research studies is that yes, there is evidence that in some patients, I have to repeat, some patients, not all patients with POTS, um, that there is, we don't know what that number is. When I say some, there is going to be a subset. We have to study this, study this. But there may be immunologic abnormalities in this cohort of patients. And hopefully we will study this in the future with future studies. Next question. Does having POTS dysautonomia make you immunocompromised? Very good question as well. My response is that based on my opinion, once again, I have to stress opinion, not data. And my opinion is utilizing research studies that we have to date, is that no, having POTS neurocardiogenic syncope and orthostatic hypotension without any known autoimmune disorders or other conditions that are associated with immunocompromised state that no we don't have, patients do not uh, don't have immunocompromised state if they just have POTS neurocardiogenic syncope and orthostatic hypotension clinically yeah i have a question just to help explain to people um, you might have covered this before I had logged on, but can you explain the difference between what the word immunocompromised means yeah. versus immune dysfunction as a concept, like a broader term, you know, some dysfunction of the immune system? How is that different? Sure. So um, the question is, um, let's, let me just back up, for example. You gave me a really good explanation on the phone yes, the yes, other day. Yes, when we yes. talked so, about so, <laughs> okay. So as I said, POTS uh, um, may have some immunologic abnormalities. We don't know yet. It may be in some patients. Maybe it's in a lot of patients, as in chronic fatigue syndrome. But this doesn't mean that there is immunocompromised state. In a compromised state, we refer to a state when we definitely know that there isn't just mild markers or immunologic abnormalities, but that patients are unable to fight off an infection quite well. And this often refers to patients with HIV, heart failure, lupus, diabetes, kidney failure, liver failure. Okay, so that's not POTS. It's very different. There is those patients with the diseases that I listed, they certainly cannot fight infections well. Common variable immune deficiency does fit into that category. Any other immunologic disorders that you have been diagnosed with, um, uh, any immune deficiency state. Okay, so there is a difference. And why? while I, I personally think that Patients with POTS may be at a slightly higher risk than healthy people for whatever complications or maybe a more difficult course. It certainly isn't a, a, on the level of risk estimation that patients with, you know, these immunocompromised states have. Okay, so that's a very important distinction right there. While we think that the risk may be slightly higher, it's like, you know, if you have any general medical condition, you're not healthy. The physiology is not normal, but the, your immune system should be functioning fairly normally. Uh, I have seen many POTS patients fight off infections very well. I have seen many patients with vasovagal syncope or neurocardiogenic syncope, another name, fight infections well. So there is no cause for concern there. 
Okay, if you want to go on to the next question, I thank you for that explanation. I think that sure. it's really important as we use different language on the support groups and people sharing memes and stuff, it's really important that we understand that immunocompromised and some immune dysfunction isn't the same thing. Absolutely. Okay. So the other uh, question, do other forms of dysautonomia increase the risk of complications? So uh, I, I think it would be safe to assume that rare forms, rare severe forms of dysautonomia may raise the risk of, complica of complications. As I mentioned uh, previously, this would include familial dysautonomia, a rare genetic disorder, multiple system atrophy, a neurodegenerative disorder, and autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy if treated with immunosuppressive therapy. If you are over age 60 um, and you ha also have hypertension, high blood pressure, and you also happen to have orthostatic hypotension, sometimes the two conditions, orthostatic hypotension and, and hypertension essential, they do go together. Then you are at risk by age and presence of hypertension. Neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is more common in older adults, so that may be another high-risk population. Diabetic polyneuropathy with dysautonomia uh, could be another risk factor since diabetes is a medical condition that seems to increase the risk of severe coronavirus and is obviously it's more prevalent also in older adults. Finally, those with dysautonomia secondary to a mitochondrial disorder, the type of mitochondrial disorder which can cause severe neuromuscular dysfunction, which can manifest in diaphragmatic weakness and respiratory insufficiency, clearly these conditions would be at risk for complication. Again, I want to repeat and probably reassure everyone that if you have POTS, neurocardiogenic syncope, or orthostatic intolerance, then as I said, your risk may be slightly higher than healthy people your age, but certainly lower than those with familial dysautonomia, multiple system atrophy, AAG, or mitochondrial disorders. Okay, next question. Do some of the conditions seen in some people with dysautonomia increase the risk of complication? complications, immune deficiency diseases, diabetes, lung damage from Sjogren's. So we don't yet know, since there is no good data on that. In the slide I showed you, patients with um, immunodeficiency state were in the minority in that large cohort from China. Again, my personal opinion is to err on the side of caution and consider all autoimmune inflammatory disorders as a possible risk until we gather more data that shows otherwise. One other point I want to make is that those patients who are malnourished with severe gastroparesis or other GI motility disorders or severe mast cell activation syndrome to the point that the patients are losing weight and can't sustain weight may need special precautions since malnutrition is oftentimes associated with immunocompromised state. Malnutrition, another very important uh, uh, um, uh, condition to remember when we say immunocompromised state. Um, this would include patients with, who receive nutrition and hydration through TPN. But if you have a port or if you have a PIC line and you're not undernourished and you're not dehydrated, uh, and you're doing well, you just need your fluids, then the immunocompromised state most likely does not apply to you, okay? Of course, you should keep your line clean in order to avoid a line infection. That's another risk. Next question, does, the, uh, the, does this outbreak mean for others, what does this outbreak mean for others with different forms of dysautonomia? Um, someone asked, as someone who has um, uh, IST and an enlarged aorta due to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, uh, this is concerning beyond the fainting that POTS causes. Um, so someone has inappropriate sinus tachycardia and they also have enlarged aorta due to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. My answer is 
we simply don't know yet how these conditions factor in the coronavirus disease and its potential complications. If you do have high blood pressure, we have to assume that you have the risk. Um, um, but if you don't have high blood pressure, um, you know, you, your risk may be no higher than someone else your age if you're a young person. Uh, as I said before, you may experience worsening of the tachycardia during the time of fever if you ever get coronavirus, and you may have worsening of tachycardia similar to if you were to have the flu. Your age and immune state would likely be more significant in determining the risk of severity of COVID. That's what I, you know, suspect. I recommend that you talk to your cardiologist and get their opinion on how enlarged aorta may or may not factor in here. But the important point is that you may want to follow the CDC recommendations for those with chronic medical conditions. I, I have a related question I wanted to interject. Yeah. It's, it's also a comorbidity question. And it's one, um, we started getting a lot of these questions once the word got out that um, hypertension was a risk factor for more serious cases of coronavirus. So there are some patients with POTS who have been diagnosed with a hyperadrenergic form of POTS where their sympathetic nervous system is very overactive. And sometimes these patients can develop hypertension, either laying down or even orthostatic hypertension when they stand up. So obviously we don't have any research data right now on this kind of hypertension uh, being a risk factor, but what is your sense on that? I mean, I think in general, you're telling people um, we don't have if we don't have any research data that proves that any of these conditions require extra precautions. But we, we, if someone's concerned that it's rational to kind of take those extra precautions just on, to be on the safe side, is, sort of, is that what you would say about? Um, uh, a hyperadrenergic POTS patient with an orthostatic hypertension? Yes, Lauren, exactly. If you have this medical condition, dysautonomia, umbrella term, then to, to just err on the side of safety, because we don't know, I would always go with the safe side and say, follow precautions for those with chronic medical conditions. But if you're asking yeah. me, are these patients hyperadrenergic parts, are they the same as the essential hypertension, the big bar I showed you at the beginning on my side? Right. Uh, my answer is no. Those are not the same diseases. Absolutely. Right. You know, in, in hyperadrenergic parts, there is just a different pathophysiology than in those people with essential hypertension whose blood pressure is always high. And uh, ironically, they appear to function on a daily basis even much better than some of our patients with, uh, you know, with spots and normal blood pressure. So it's just a different vascular physiology than hyperadrenergic parts. Okay. Um, and then a related question, someone, I know what you're going to answer, but I think it's a, it's a probably a question a lot of people are wondering. Um, if you, when you take Florinaf, if you get a little hypertension from taking it, should you lower your dose? So I, I can oh, guess the you answer. Mean, you mean don't take your medicine without talking to your doctor, right? But Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. When, when we have patients on Florinaf and Midadrin and beta blockers and all other POTS medications, I always ask the patients to monitor their blood pressure and heart rate so we can adjust accordingly. But if your question is, you know, should you prepare for possible coronavirus and what if that little, high, little higher blood pressure from Florinaf will make you more susceptible? The answer is A, we don't know. We don't know. But the answer B is, you know, it's not a great thing to walk around with high blood pressure anyway. So talk to your POTS doctor and see if you really do need to decrease the dose. Okay. Um, there's so many questions people are sending in, and a lot of them are really good, broad questions that apply to a lot of people. If um, those of you who are typing in questions, if you could avoid sending in questions about your personal story, like, you know, I have five, these five diagnoses, am I at high risk? Um, try to make it a more um, broader question. And there's so many, we're not gonna be able to get through all of them, but I'm trying to, um, we'll try to pick some good ones. So Dr. B, if you have some other questions on the list from earlier today, okay. if you wanna go through, maybe we can try to uh, go through them a little quicker so that yes, uh, I, we, I we can let you go at some point this evening. <laughs> You gave me a lot, so I'll try to go fast. Okay, somebody said, you know, they have a house with teenagers. 
Uh, everyone is home now. The teenagers have pots and other conditions like Chiari, EDS. Uh, they're doing everything, hand washing, it's all good, uh, but they have a few friends. They want to, you know, socialize. Uh, is it okay for them to, to be with some, some of those people when they're out of school? My answer is no. <laughs> Avoid all play dates in the next few weeks. Uh, you don't know if your friends' parents, wh where, you know, the family of those friends have been, what's in the household, are they practicing social distancing, so stay home. Stay home with your family, play with your siblings, avoid play dates with other people for it, for the next few weeks until we learn more about the state of our, you know, of our situation. Uh, the second question is, um, the teens with POTS, um, do, does this put them at a higher risk to become much sicker than other children should they con contact uh, uh, contract coronavirus? As I said before, we don't know. We don't have this information. Um, but generally speaking, children and teenagers, as again, follow my curve here, they do quite well with this virus. So uh, while POTS may present this extra thing, extra factor, there is no, there is no reason to suspect that uh, teens and kids with spots may, may do worse. We don't know. We have to see how it plays out here. Uh, the other question is, um, let's see, somebody said there are patients at CHOP, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They have appointments. Should we cancel them if they are routine appointments? Very important question. So I can't comment on whether anyone should cancel the, their doctor's appointments. You should definitely talk to your doctor ahead of time and ask them. At the Satonomia Clinic here, we have been doing phone and video consults for many years and will continue to do so. And therefore, my system is already set up to, to do this, but many doctors are only now switching to telemedicine medicine in this pandemic. So check with your doctors, wherever they are, if they have a system in place for patients to avoid going to the doctor, but still get your timely follow-up care. And, you know, now is the time to maybe avoid all non-essential, non-diagnostic, non-acute care, but that's not my decision. It's going to be between you and your doctor to decide what to cancel and what to go and, and, and you know, wash your hands and, and brave the situation. It's another question. I have vasovagal syncope due to cardi inhibition with asystole. My heart, my heart stopped for 10 seconds on the till table test, but it's well controlled now. Should I be worried about the coronavirus? My answer is you should be concerned as much or as little as the next person your age. Vaso, if vasovagal syncope is your only diagnosis, you are not at a higher risk from vasovagal syncope than any other person your age. Um, and okay. then, uh, you have more questions okay. or you want me to go? Oh my God, there's like hundreds of them on here. So let me ask you some of these, okay? Because I think they're they're even better than some of the ones that got emailed in. So, so um, uh, of the standard um, COVID-19 treatments, if someone does get this, there are sort of, now there's no cure for this virus. There's no specific treatment, but there's a lot of sort of supportive measures that we that people can take, like the same types of things you might take if you had a bad flu. Um, so this person is asking, are there any of this any of the COVID-19 treatments that are contraindicated in people with dysautonomia? So, well, very um, First of all, there, we, we don't have very good treatments. It's supportive care consisting if you, if you have a problem with oxygenation, you, you will have supplemental oxygen, fluids, things like that. So right. um, we have to step away from this dysautonomia for a second. If you're truly sick with coronavirus and you can't breathe, it's the time to call your doctor and see where to go, which ER, which urgent care. So aside from dysautonomia, we really have to worry more about about uh, um, a, a possible consequences on your lungs. That's what we worry about. Less of the heart rate and more on the breathing. Right. I, I would say um, uh, it, the, some of the therapies, if someone has a way more, you know, very severe case where they're being, you know, they're putting on a ventilator or they're, you know, they're getting a lot of uh, oxygen. Um, if it's, if it's for a while, you know, um, plain oxygen by itself can sort of dry out your lungs, and that could be kind of irritating to people. But I think um, 
you will be treated by some kind of pulmonary critical care specialist that is uh, well aware of how to um, treat people in acute distress. And it's, um, it's sort of hard to, I mean, I, I have actually had pneumonia and I've been in the hospital from other infections. Um, I have some uncooperative lungs. And uh, I was that patient thinking, how is this drug going to mess up, mess me up because I have POTS and I'm so sensitive to every medication and, you know, my body like overreacts to everything. Um, but sometimes you just have to trust, you know, you just have to let the doctors do their job and not um, put up defenses to everything. If you're in a, a life or death situation in the ICU, just, you know, uh, let them do what they're trained to do. I know it's hard to do that when you've been through a lot of really stressful things with doctors, you know, where, where they don't know what POTS is, they don't know what EDS is, whatever, all of our, our unknown diagnoses, but they do know how to treat people in acute respiratory distress, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, in, in those dire situations, uh, you know, POTS and other forms of dysautonomia will probably be the least of the worries when the doctors are trying to make sure you're breathing okay and your organs are working. So that's not really a concerning to me. And they always give fluids. So, you know, that's going to happen in, in the hospital or ICU. Fluids is the way to go. Yeah. Um, so, um, people are also asking, um, uh, do, do people, because sometimes people with dysautonomia have, a, like, an abnormally low body temperature to begin with, especially if they're hypovolemic or they're underweight, um, would it be harder to recognize the symptoms of COVID-19 if you normally run a low body temperature? Good question. Uh, sure. In that case, you got to go by a mild fever. You don't have to have a high fever to have coronavirus. You can have mild fever, and in some cases, there is no fever. That's important to, to understand. So if you normally run low, but you hit like 99.4, 99.5, uh, that's the time when you want to ask, call your doctor. Don't go there, but call your doctor and um, uh, see what they have to say. If you have cough and low grade fever, but you usually run low, shortness of breath, you have this achy flu-like symptom, that's the time to call your doctor. There, there's another question in here, and um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start the answer on it because I've been intensely yeah. researching it myself. Someone has asked, um, uh, what is the effect uh, if you get uh, IVIG or subcutaneous IG, this is um, intravenous immunoglobulin, and what does that affect on the immune system? And is this um, going to be helpful or harmful if you get exposed to coronavirus? So I've, uh, I am on uh, immunoglobulin for an autoimmune disease that causes my dysautonomia. So I intensely researched this and asked like every dysautonomia expert I could. And the answer I got was, you know, IVIG, it, it, it sort of changes your immune system a little bit, but it isn't expected to weaken your immune system that in a way that makes it more dangerous for you to get this. Um, eventually, uh, IgG antibodies from people who have had COVID-19 and survived will end up in IgG product, which is normal. That, you know, that's the whole point of IVIG is to give you, borrow everybody else's immune system. So um, I don't know how long it takes for IVIG to catch up with the current infections happening, probably a few months. Um, but eventually, um, being on IVIG, you could maybe even be a little bit protective towards this um, uh, in the long run, like it is towards um, other common infections, the flu and, and you know, the common cold, um, because it, you're borrowing antibodies from other people who've already had that infection. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you want to add to that, Dr. B. I just, I don't want people, if you're on IVIG, I don't think you should worry. Uh, just very little. You know, my colleagues and I in neurology are wondering, what do we do for patients with multiple sclerosis, myasthenia, and other um, uh, immune conditions? And the consensus is do not stop your medications right now. Keep taking your medications as is. Uh, and of course, discuss all of that with your doctor, but none of the doctors are recommending that you stop it because you're worried that the medication is making you immunosuppressed. However, if you do have coronavirus infection, while you're waiting for testing, some of the experts in neurology say that you should stop it 
in those few days while you wait, wait waiting for test results. Again, every situation is different, every patient is different. So talk to your neurologist, talk to your rheumatologist and your immunologist to get the accurate information. Okay. Um, so we have a lot of questions from people asking if mast cell activation syndrome makes you more at risk Absolutely. of a severe, a severe reaction. Yeah. Uh, for, fortunately, I discussed it with my colleagues in mast cell world, and the and the predominant opinion is that no, having mast cell activation syndrome by itself does not make you immunocompromised or immunosuppressed. Now, there are severe cases of mast cell where uh, patients have severe symptoms, are on medications to suppress hyperactive mast cells, or they're not eating, they're unable to eat well, and so they are malnourished. In that case, yes, but in the vast majority of stable mast cell patients, we don't think so. Um, so here's... Um... You know, a question, should should patients hydrate more than normal if they feel like they're getting sick, even if it may not be coronavirus? And I would say yes. I mean, we're all, almost everyone with dysautonomia is supposed to hydrate more than a normal person just because of the nature of our illness. And there's nothing really wrong with increasing your hydration even more. So long as you're getting enough electrolytes, you're not just giving yourself straight up water and sort of washing yourself out. Um, you know, if you feel a cold coming on, even if it, whether you think it's coronavirus or it's just a regular cold, um, it's always a good idea to increase your hydration, right? Do you, do you agree with that? Agree. Nothing to add. Yes, agree with you completely. Okay. Um, okay, so um, if, if someone is on um, um, immune, I wouldn't say immune suppressing drugs, but drugs that change the immune system like Singulair, um, is that potentially um, immune suppressing in, in a way that's concerning for coronavirus? No, none of the mast cell drugs, the common ones, and the histamines, mast cell stabilizing agents, none of them are immunosuppressive. Oh, we got one that's not a question. It's just a comment. This doctor is amazing. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what about college students? Um, you know, if you're... If your college student has dysautonomia, do you do you want them staying on campus uh, in a dorm, or do you think that it would be um, a good preventative measure to sort of have them come home temporarily? Uh, That's kind well, of hard to say. You know, a lot of colleges are actually asking you to go home. I don't believe that there, that anyone is staying on in the dorms. So that I have no idea. You have to, yeah. and you know, it's 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 up to the state which colleges are closed which dorms are closed check with your state health department yeah um i heard a question and it wasn't it wasn't a a, a post related question it was just uh you know general conversation on facebook someone um really wanted to stay home because they were you know concerned that they might be at risk of a more serious infection and they had to work and they couldn't figure out, um, their boss was not interested in closing and they really didn't have an essential service type of job where you really have to be there like like healthcare or running the electric company or something like that. And so um, this person just um, <laughs> decided to tell their employer that they had, they thought they were, that they were getting a bad cold. And so their employer was like, don't come in. <laughs> so just an idea for those of you who work, I, I'm not saying you should lie to your employer um, because they certainly might ask you for a doctor's note or something. But um, if you are truly concerned and feel that you need to step out of work for a few days <laughs> until, until things are a little bit calmer, um, that's an idea. Um, not, not, not necessarily a very good idea, but just mentioning it. As, as, you, as doctor, a, you know, I've had, uh, I've had messages where people who were not my patients were asking me to give them notes, exactly what you said, because they have dysautonomia. I, I can't do that. I don't know patients that I not mind. So talk to your own doctor about that. Yeah. Um, so we're we're at eight o'clock. There's like hundreds of questions on here. I actually wanted to do an interactive poll with you guys. Um, I'm not sure it's gonna. I don't think it's gonna work because uh, I'm not. I'm calling in by phone and I'm not. Never mind. I won't do the poll. I was actually just gonna ask people. Um, 
you know, have you reached out to your doctors with coronavirus questions and stuff like that. Um, but I did want to mention sort of some next steps that Dysautonomy International is going to be taking. Um, and we are continuously in touch with Dr. Blitchin and the other doctors on our medical advisory board. Um, you know, we, we immediately asked them the question, you know, do you think this is going to impact people with dysautonomia differently? And there's there's different opinions and there's not a lot of data, right? That's what we need to answer our, your very good questions. We need research data. So um, what we're doing at Dysautonomy International is we are actually going to be launching a dysautonomia COVID-19 research study to ask you for your experiences should you be unfortunately uh, getting this. And we, we should expect to see some patients and you know caregivers on our support groups who are part of our community. Um, you know, people are going to start reporting that they got this. And I, I really want everyone to remember that one person's story that you see on Facebook isn't going to be everyone's story. We're all a little bit different. Um, one of my POTS friends from Long Island actually just um, announced that she has possibly has this. She's waiting for her testing. It's very hard to get tested in some states um, unless you're like in the hospital on oxygen. So there's going to be a lot of people who might get it who never actually get a confirmed diagnosis. But in any event, um, She's, uh, she was well enough to write a, a newspaper article about it. <laughs> so, um, but she's not, you know, she's not feeling so good. And so it's scary when you hear this story and you think, oh gosh, is that going to happen to me? So I just want people to remember that when you're sharing stuff online, you know, let's not kind of whip ourselves into a panic any more than the public already has. Um, so we're going to launch a research study to try to understand with actual data and numbers, you know, what, what the experience of our patient community is. Um, also, we are rescheduling our events. I'm sure a lot of you have heard by now. We're postponing the annual conference that was scheduled for June. Uh, we're postponing the Boston Pots Walk and some of our other big fundraising events. And so it's definitely a challenging time for, for us, but as it is for everyone. Um, but we are, we are hopeful that things will get rescheduled. And we're also going to do expanded online engagement so that, um, you know, a lot of us with dysautonomia are home more than the usual person anyways. <laughs> but now even um, a lot of our, you know, more active um, people who might work outside the home or whatnot are now going to also be home. So we're going to have um, more webinars. We're going to have local support group video chats, like small group chats, um, rather than the in-person meetings. We're going to offer some live um, exercise and relaxation um, online video classes that are geared for people with dysautonomia. And we're gonna also offer some tips and fun ideas to kind of keep your mind off of coronavirus. Cause I do think um, that, you know, this, this nonstop frenzy that we're all seeing on the news, in social media, in any newspaper that gets delivered to your house, it's overwhelming even for people who aren't dealing with chronic illness. So I think it's important that we, with intent, take steps to sort of protect our mental health and and um, sort of de-stress a little bit once once a day at least, kind of stay grounded because, um, you know, it, it's really scary living through this, but um, at the end of the day, we're going to get through it. Think about things that um, civilization has been through before in history and thing, things maybe your grandparents or great-grandparents went through during World War One or World War II. And, you know, we're going to we're going to get through, um, even if we're having uh, some challenges. So, uh, Dr. B, do you have other stuff that you wanted to add? Um, uh, you mean questions? I, I, or what do you want me to talk about? I have a lot of. Huh? <laughs> if you, well, we're past our eight o'clock end time. We did start a little late. Um, so, if you wanted to answer a few more questions, or if you wanted to just offer some closing thoughts, whatever is up to you. I don't want to keep you on the phone all night. But if we went through these questions, it would be like a three-day webinar. So. Right, right. <laughs> so, I will conclude. Uh, again, I'll reiterate some important points is that my opinion is to err on the side of caution for patients with autonomic and autoimmune disorders when assessing the risk for coronavirus. This is not because patients with autonomic and autoimmune conditions are at the known high risk factor, 
factor. This is because most patients, this is not because most patients are immunocompromised. Most patients are not immunocompromised. I want to stress that. But because in situations when we don't know, um, I like to overestimate rather than underestimate the risk. So safety is of primary importance. So please practice social distancing and all of the CDC recommended precautions and guidelines for people over the age of 60 and those with chronic medical conditions. All of that would apply to patients with any type of dysautonomia simply by having a, com a, a general comorbid medical condition. These precautions are outlined, all of that, what you know, the CDC wrote, I outlined in my second article on coronavirus and dysautonomia, which you need to do now, which is available on our dysautonomia clinic blog and was also republished by the Mighty and the Yahoo News. Mm -hmm. So thank you for attending. Uh, I hopefully this was informative. We didn't get through a hundred million questions, but we got through important ones. <laughs> so stay stay safe everyone and stay away from each other <laughs> thank you so much for your time and your expertise on this and we're going to try to answer some of those questions in upcoming social media posts maybe we'll do like q a with the experts to try to get some of the other really popular questions questions answered because there's so many good ones and i think that the, the fact that our patients are asking these questions shows that we are uh, a lot of them are pretty medically savvy questions. You know, I, I think because we have a complicated chronic illness, we kind of become experts in our own disease. And um, that's leaded, you know, we have some really good questions on here. So we'll try to get to as many of them as we can in the, in the coming weeks. Um, so until then, uh, everybody have a good night. Don't watch the evening news. It wasn't good. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.